Welcome back, my friends. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you stack silver and you like your daily news to be unfiltered, uncensored, unbiased, you've come to the right place because I post daily videos. And today we have Andy Sheckman, CEO of Miles Franklin. I went through hundreds and hundreds of comments on our past 24 episodes. I found a common theme of the most uh, interesting and common questions. And I want to throw these questions at Andy. Um, so I think this is going to be a great episode. We're going to be talking about stuff like what's a black swan event and which is the most likely to happen. Uh, what's a reverse repo market? How do you think we would default or pay back this $34 trillion? What's the best case scenario moving forward? So lots of interesting stuff. Um, so I'm excited to hear how he responds. And I think you guys will be as well. So uh, first off, Andy, what's up? Good to see you again. Uh, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Good to see you also. And uh, yeah, I, I look forward to answering the questions. I like the I like the back and forth. Those are the things that, you know, sometimes we take for granted and don't understand that there are people out there wanting to know a little bit yeah. more of an explanation on things. I, I like doing that better than just talking. The first question is talking about a black swan event and which is most likely to happen? What do you think about that? Well, I, I mean, look, I, there are so many potential black swans. And, you know, whether you're talking, you know, war or geopolitical events across the globe uh, uh, or, or domestic terrorism events. You know, I was talking to my father this morning. He says, you know, we have 10 million people who've entered the country illegally. If two tenths of a percent of those, just one or two tenths of a percent are actually on the terror watch list, and slid by instead of the ones that were actually caught. You have thousands of people in this country who are yeah, in, in this country with bad intentions. And that could is. that be the black swan? You got the head of the FBI saying he's never been more concerned about this in his career, and he sees red lights flashing everywhere. Uh, you know, you have the, the, the folks at the World Bank um, who are meeting right now in Davos, World Economic Forum, rather, who who are on their website have uh, a simulation of uh, a cyber attack. Now, the last time they had something like this on their website was 2019, it was a pandemic. And lo and behold, what did we find? But a pandemic. Now, I'm not saying that will happen, but <clears throat> certainly you take a look at uh, the, the, the movie the Obamas uh, produced for Netflix. It's about a, a cyber attack. And we are very, very much um married if you will to the internet not only for our finances but you know to to heat and cool your home to get in the front door to turn on your alarm to access your bank account to access your brokerage yeah. account uh you know everything is digital nowadays and this is one of the you know, one of the nice things about having gold and silver of course is that it, it carries no counterparty liability and, you know, holding digital assets, there is counterparty risk, counterparty liability, even as simple as, as shutting down the Internet or creating some sort of a electromagnetic pulse or a solar flare or whatever it may be that would, would create this problem. So if I had to guess, uh, the black swans would come from, from one of three areas. Number one uh, could be a cyber attack, cyber threat or solar flare, something that would would render the internet or the electrical grid or whatever it may be um, inoperable for a period of time, hopefully not too long, God willing. And one could be a homegrown terror threat. We've been warned this uh, ad nauseum by the, by the head of the FBI and certainly with all the people entering this country illegally every single day, the chances of that happening, people entering this country for unpure reasons becomes greater and greater and greater when you look at the numbers that are coming in. And then the third is the one that I've focused on forever. And that's just the growing de-dollarization trend, uh, the BRICS trend, uh, the, the countries like United Arab Emirates, which is the seventh largest producer of oil in the world and just joined BRICS alongside Saudi Arabia, making the public admission, hey, we're not taking dollars for oil anymore going forward. And this growing union of countries um, that is gaining legitimacy, now, I don't know if that one will happen in 2024. Maybe it does. There's 200 meetings between now and October when they have their big official meeting. All of these BRICS meetings are in Russia, different parts of Russia, but all of them have to do with the BRICS. And uh, now that Russia holds the presidency this year, as it rotates every year, and the big meeting where, where they're going to introduce the new 
members, over 30, according to Putin, have formally applied, another 20 have informally applied, you know, that's in October. So whether it be that in October, the election in November, or all of the things surrounding that lead up to it with the fragility of the over-leveraged, undercapitalized banks, all the people who've entered this country illegally, some with unpure intentions, uh, and or the possibility of some form of a cyber attack or, or cyber event, whether it's man-made or not, um, we're too reliant upon a system that if it goes down, then what? And everyone's wealth these days and everyone's accessibility to their whole lives seems to be at the, at the tip of their fingers on their iPhone. Well, if you can't access the internet, watch the movie that the Obamas produced. It's on Netflix with Julia Roberts um, and Kevin Bacon. It's pretty freaking scary, actually. And I didn't know that the Obamas produced it until after I watched it, but it basically is a, a cyber attack <clears throat> with misinformation disseminated by our foes, creating divisiveness amongst the, the populace, which basically eat themselves. I don't mean physically eat themselves, but turn on each other. Uh, and it goes to show it's almost like a lab experiment. What would happen when no one trusts their neighbor? When, you know, you're the guy, Slayer, who's got all of the silver and, and preparation at home, and everyone knows that. How paranoid do you get when there's a knock on your door? You know, do you come to the door with a shotgun in your hand? Do you even answer the door? And I think that's kind of what this whole movie uh, portrayed and, and how quickly... Uh, love thy neighbor turns to, you know, every man and woman for themselves. So I'd like to hope none of these things happen. But look, if anything I've learned over the last three, four years is that things that you would never think could happen, could happen like a pandemic. I'll never forget yeah. early <clears throat> December, uh, <clears throat> January, February of 2020, where um, I'm watching, um, I was watching, what's his name? Um an economist who I who I like an awful lot. I can't believe I can't think of his name right now. Um, Chris Martinson, who is an epidemiologist as well as a hell of an economist. And he was saying, you know, within a month or two, everyone will be wearing a, a facial covering and you'll get a stink eye look if you're not. And I'm thinking, looking at my wife saying, come on, could this really be true? He was talking about before anyone. I was watching this in, you know, in, in, in the early days before it became obvious this was happening. He said, this is real. This is happening. It's expanding and it's coming our way. I went to Costco and came back with $2,000 worth of food and water. My kids looked at me like I was insane. So I think I've learned that to expect the unexpected. And I, I think it's a wise question and something that leads to a bigger issue. And that is of preparation. Uh, even if it is reluctantly preparing, be prepared, have some cash on hand, small bills, have some gold and silver on hand, smaller, the better in terms of one ounce or fractional ounce pieces, uh, have some food and water good enough for a couple of months, have a, uh, something to protect your family with. And I was on a podcast earlier today where I said, look, the, t the Titanic sunk. I was asked the same question and it sunk and people died because it could never sink and they didn't have enough life rafts or easily accept accessible. Right. Build your life raft, get your house in order and hope you never need to use it. Be damn glad you have it if you do. And if not, do donate some food to a food shelf or eat it, you know, and use, rotate the stuff that you have in there and take your gun and go do some target practice, whatever it may be. I think being prepared right now has never been more important when you realize the potential of a black swan. You covered so many things like the cyber. A lot of people really do rely. We're in a new digital era, you know, even with crypto, Bitcoin ATMs, everything's a swipe of a card, right? Online banking. And that's one of the reasons why I think physical metals are so important, especially for trading or bartering if something were to happen. And um, people will say, well, cryptocurrency, same thing, digital. Even if your money is on an Exodus wallet, you know, a, a cold wallet stored offline, you're still reliant on the internet or even banks shutting down. Even if you have your stuff in a safety deposit box, I feel more comfortable being in complete control. Yeah, I think counterparty liability or the removal of it, the complete absence of it is sound. I think yeah. the whole concept of counterparty liability will take on a whole new phrase or new meaning over the next um, weeks and months and, and years ahead as as this system unwinds that 
you know, is, is very over leveraged and, and under capitalized. And with that, you have the risk of, of, of default and of failure and, and the, the ability to value something based upon a counterparty's ability to perform, especially in the case of derivatives is a problem. Yeah. So yeah, removal of counterparty risk adds value that I don't even think you can put a, a price tag on at this point. Yeah. Sometimes it's unrealistic, you know, like if you're, if you're going to buy, you know, like millions upon millions of dollars in gold and silver, you know, you, you know, that's kind of unrealistic just having your, you know, in your closet or something. But um, you mentioned also, and this is the one I think is growing to be most likely, like the question was, which you think most likely you mentioned de-dollarization, but the amount of that, that statistic you said, even if it's like 2.2%, that's still thousands of people that could be on the watch list or terrorist that is that is scary i feel like yeah. that's also growing and it all is intertwined i feel like all of this especially the last two de-dollarization and terrorism i feel like those two could be kind of weaving into each other making it even speed up quicker um for being the most likely which is even more scary um but yeah wow it's that's stuff to think about yep 100 um, i agree but yeah. So, so second question, um, what's a reverse repo market and how does it help banks? Well, it, it really doesn't help. I guess it helps the banks. It helps the money market funds, the reverse repo market. You can think of it as having cash and investing it overnight for a return. And, and it's, it's, it's basically guaranteed by the federal reserve. The federal reserve is backing it where in essence, you have more cash than you need and you want to invest it somewhere with safety. So the banks take their cash, they pledge it to the reverse repo market where another counterparty will will agree to sell them an asset like a treasury for that cash and to buy it back at a higher price over a period of time. Usually the next day, sometimes it can go longer, days or weeks. But in essence, it's just a way for... Um, Really, like for example, the money market funds who are are want to in to to provide a stable return for their money market account, they take the money and they put it in the overnight reverse repo market, which is guaranteeing over five percent backed by the Federal Reserve. And so it it is a way to give cash to entities and and companies that need cash overnight, and another way for you know for those companies who need cash to pledge their securities overnight. And, and, and it's just a way for the system to provide liquidity for some and provide return for others. Uh, but it's draining. And the reason that it is draining, the reason it is disappearing is because you can get a rate at the overnight. So the, the money markets, they will take, they're paying a rate of, of over 5%, which takes all the money out of the banks and goes into the commercial banks and the and the institutions that provide money markets. So they put that money market money in the overnight overnight reverse repo market. The reason it's draining is that at the same time, the treasury is offering a yield on short-term treasuries, like 90-day treasuries or six-month treasuries above the overnight reverse repo rate market. So that money is leaving the reverse repo and going right to the treasury and, and buying directly from the treasury. So all of this liquidity is being sucked out of the banking system it is going into the treasury to fund their spending habit and and eventually the, the the treasury will spend that money which will find its way back into the banking system to reliquify it but look the bottom line is is that the reverse repo market doesn't really help the banks in fact i would argue it hurts the banks what it does is it helps the money market accounts it helps some banks it helps some institutions who have more cash than they than they need and don't want to lend it out into an economy where you have risk in giving it to someone like you or me for a, a car loan or a mortgage or a student loan or a home equity loan, even though they can make a higher rate of return and give it to the Federal Reserve overnight and get a guaranteed rate of return with protection. So, you know, it does help in some respects, but it hurts the economy. I look at it as an indictment of the economy where all of these banks and institutions would rather put their money in the overnight reverse repo market guaranteed by the Fed than lend it out to help build the economy because there's too much risk out there. So when the overnight reverse repo market drains and it's expected to be completely drained by March or April at the current pace, 
Then the question is, where does the, the Treasury get all of this excess slush fund? Where do they get the money to fund their spending habits? And that's why I believe, you know, they have to raise rates higher to attract the demand. So all this talk about, you know, the, the Fed lowering rates, yeah, it, it may happen on the very, very, very short term front end of the of the uh, curve on the, the overnight lending, um, the federal funds rate. But what that will do is will incentivize the government to spend more, which will create more inflation and rates on the back end have to go higher. So look, we're in a very difficult situation. And, and as the, for the last year and a half, all the money that's left the banking system chasing yield in the overnight reverse repo market through the money markets is disappearing. Question is where does the treasury get their funds then? So, uh, it's been a short-term fix for for all of this money, but um, I don't look at it really as a benefit to the banks in mass. I look at it as a hindrance to many banks and to those who are using it, almost an indictment of the system because they'd rather d lend it with safety to the Fed than to you and I to to fund yeah. uh, free market capitalism. Wow, uh, you mentioned inflation. What do you think the country looks like under hyperinflation? Well, the byproduct of hyperinflation would be interest rates that would have to rise to compensate for the loss of purchasing power. I've talked about that moment. I see it where OPEC dumps the dollar officially. It's one thing for, for the United Arab Emirates to say it. It's one thing for Russia and Iran to say it. And they all three have. It's another thing for all of OPEC and the OPEC plus countries to say we're no longer taking dollars. Every country on the planet has had to stockpile them for the last 50 years, part of the petrodollar deal. And if that incentive is gone and everyone dumps it, there's your hyperinflationary moment where all of the dollars, many more outside the country than in, dump and hit our shores and overwhelm the issuer, us, and we're choking on dollars, creating a hyperinflationary moment. If you have 20% inflation, you can't have 5% interest rates. You might as well use your currency as toilet paper. So inflate, interest rates would have to rise above the level of inflation to attract any investment in the currency. And in doing that, you have a situation where it's the perfect storm. It's the great reset. Stocks collapse, bonds collapse, real estate collapse, the banks collapse because they're all over leveraged. Rising rates will blow up the banks. Rising rates makes in, uh, uh, real estate way too expensive. There'll be no loans. People won't be able to to buy new homes it, it it no one will buy stocks that are overvalued in in an environment of great risk when they can buy treasuries earning double digit with safety supposed safety that's the theory anyway and all of the bonds in circulation when rates spike like that the same thing that's happened to the banks by rates going from zero percent on the federal funds to up to five percent has created massive, massive unrealized losses by the banks. What happens if rates went to 20%? It would blow everything up, everything. It's the perfect storm. Stocks, bonds, real estate, the dollar, because it's dumped, and the banks. All are inversely correlated to a rise in interest rates that would happen organically from hyperinflation. And it is the perfect storm. Um, and it's something that I've talked about for a long time and something I see happening. If we lose the petro status and the synthetic demand that the world has witnessed for, for dollar demand, in essence, because it's the petrodollar, if that is gone and those dollars hit our shore, there's hyperinflation. The byproduct of massive spiking interest rates will be a very unpleasant religious experience for most people in this country. It is the Great Reset. So hyperinflation, it is the Great Reset. <laughs> Dumping their dollars for ex in exchange for what? Say that again. Dumping the dollar for in, in exchange anything. for what? Anything. Anything. Just anything. I mean, other currencies or commodities, natural resources, anything. Okay. And in other in other words, <clears throat> countries won't won't be incentivized to stockpile them anymore, nor to buy our treasuries. Part of the petrodollar deal was. They that everyone buys oil in dollars, and then we they take the excess dollars and invest in our treasuries. Well, if they're not buying treasuries, in fact, they're selling them. If they're not stockpiling dollars, they're selling them into the open market and buying other currencies or buying other commodities or what have you. And there is yeah. no demand to keep stockpiling and accumulating <laughs> um, dollars to buy oil. And if you lose the demand to hold and or accumulate dial, uh, dollars to buy energy, 
then you are, have a situation where there are far more dollars hitting back our shores because no one outside the country needs them or wants them. So they come back home and that's where the hyperinflation starts. And, and that would be buying anything, art, uh, commodities, yeah. okay. uh, cars, that makes sense. anything that, and if you look at the wealthiest people in the world, they don't have massive bank accounts, so they probably do, but they, they don't. They have huge asset portfolios. Right. And that's what they would do. It'd be a rush to buy anything. My dad has a friend, very wealthy man, who's a, a car enthusiast, and he was in Argentina when uh, they were experiencing hyperinflation, and he was in a Ferrari dealership. And he, I remember him calling my father, saying it's the craziest thing. There's a chalkboard in the front of the the dealership that I'm in, and they keep erasing the prices of the Ferraris that are written in in chalk, and putting every every twenty minutes they're adding, you know they're increasing the price of the car because the, the, the currency was inflating so rapidly. And yeah. in a, in an era where uh, information and money can be moved so rapidly, uh, it, it can happen very quickly. You know, hyperinflation during the Weimar Republic was a slower experience because people would get paid. They would take their money and run as fast as they could to the store to buy whatever wasn't nailed down. Now, when you get paid by Venmo or Zelle or instant ACH into your account or by wire bang, you move that money as fast as you can. And it's funny because uh, the head of the IMF, Kristalina Georgieva, said part of the problem with the U.S. banking system is the ability of people to move it so rapidly. This is why banks will collapse and you can see these types of problems. Well, you know, they're trying to lock us in. I don't know. But hyperinflation is something that I think could very well be in our future. Hyperstagflation, even worse, where you have much higher prices characterized by little or no economic growth and higher taxes. That's the worst of both. That's that's the printing press meets the Great Depression. And I think you see an event where the dollar gets dumped globally as, as the petro standard. And, and that's exactly the road that we could be find ourselves on. Do you think we could default or or find a way to I don't think personally we could pay back 34 trillion. I think it would have to be a default or a reset. But what what are your thoughts on that? They have on two the, choices to inflate or default. The third is find yeah. a villain. That 34 trillion yeah, doesn't take into that doesn't take into account Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and government military pensions. Social Security is 77 trillion underfunded. I, I say it on every interview I do, and it, some people probably grow tired of hearing it, but a trillion seconds ago was 31,688 yeah. years ago. You can't pay that back. How do you yeah, pay that back? I, yeah. we, we spent $900 billion on interest payments alone this last year. This year, it's projected to be $1.2 trillion. In six and a half years, it, it projects to take 100% of all the tax revenues just to pay the interest on the debt and mandatory entitlement spending, like Social Security. And so how do you maintain being the dominant superpower militarily and financially when all discretionary spending, including military spending, has to be borrowed? We're borrowing money so fast, we're issuing over a trillion dollars of debt per quarter. That would have been considered unimaginable years ago. So we're entering the late yeah. stages where we yeah. added in the span of one year, we added $2.6 trillion in debt to our national debt from 31.4 to 34 trillion from January 1 to January 1, 2024. That took 230 years to do that the first time. So the acceleration and debt accumulation is heading us down that path where the rest of the world says, you know, why should we sell you our goods when you're going to inflate away the currency, when you're going to destroy the bond market, and when you're piling on debt at such a fast level that there's no way it will ever be repaid back other than to hyperinflate. So, you know, my my mentor, Richard Russell, always used to say back 10 years ago, 15 years ago, the Fed has two choices, but to inflate or die. And that's why I come up with third choice, and that's find a villain. And that's Putin and Xi Jinping and OPEC for, for going away from the dollar as a sole settlement currency for oil. So, yeah, I, I think the, the likelihood of those kinds of things becomes more and more and more realistic and very unpleasant if you play it out in your head. So let's hope it doesn't happen. But that would lead cred credibility to the statement that if you are not a contrarian, you'll end up being a victim. If you hold all your assets yeah. in dollars, you're destined to go broke if that happens. And I'd like to think it won't, but ask yourself, how the hell do we pay for all of this stuff? 
How the hell can we do it in an environment where in six years we have to borrow every single penny to do anything that is considered discretionary, which would be anything other than paying the interest on the debt and the mandatory entitlement spending? And that doesn't even include, this is from the Congressional Budget Office, which is a, a bipartisan think tank. I mean, one of the last bipartisan entities in Washington. That doesn't even include the 10 million people who have entered this country illegally. Who's going to pay for their housing and their schooling and their medical and all of this stuff? The taxpayer, more debt, more. We have $10 trillion due this year in, in bonds that are coming due. How the hell are you going to pay for $10 trillion? Oh, I got a good idea. Let's borrow some more. So it's basically you're borrowing money to pay your credit card bill. You're borrowing money to keep the lights on, but you're never paying down the bill. I mean, it's at what point do you just be considered too big of a risk to keep as a client anymore? At what point does the rest of the world look that way? Instead of Visa and MasterCard looking at you that way, what point does the world look at us that way? And I think we're getting closer and closer to that moment. Yeah, I always say getting ourselves out of debt by replacing with more debt. It's like trying to pay off a credit card with another credit card. That's what it is. Uh, yeah, it's crazy. Or you calling the, American Express and saying, listen, if you don't up my limit, give me the black card with no limit, I'm going to default. So either you get something or you get nothing. And I mean, that's kind of what it is. And and it's it's really a sad crazy. state of affairs where we've reached a point where we have to borrow money, not only to pay the interest on the debt, but to even hope of paying our obligations, the $10 trillion in bonds that come due in 2024. You know, it, it's a it's it's. We've gone so far down the rabbit hole that there's really very few ways to rectify this. You know, we can't tax our way out of it. We've we've offshored so much of our production, we can't produce our way out of it. So we can inflate, we can default, or we find a villain or, or some combination of the yeah. three. But we're right at 130% debt to GDP, just under it. And there's never been a country in history that's crossed that line without defaulting or hyperinflating. So these questions are legitimate. Whether they happen this year or next, the mathematics of it say we're getting closer to that moment any way you look at it. Yeah. I mean, every fiat-based system throughout history lasts around a century at most. Like, it, it's designed to fail. Like, it literally is designed to fail. Every single like, fiat currency in the history of man has failed. Every single yeah, one. Every and the dollar one. will be no different. Every yeah. single currency goes to its intrinsic value of paper zero. And I, I think that's you know, the path that we are on. And this is why you hear talk of of gold backing and of and using blockchain and, and gold to underpin a new system. Because yep. if you if you don't, there's no credibility in a system where the politicians can choose inflation yeah. over austerity, the difficult decisions. And uh, can you imagine waking up in a world with no food stamps, no welfare checks, no unemployment checks, none of that? And, you know, it would be chaos in a matter of moments with all of the lawlessness we have in the cities right now. Can you imagine what it would be like when people woke up hungry and no government assistance to help? Yeah. And, you know, it's a scary thought, but I think it's something people ought to ponder uh, yeah. once in a while to get a good idea of what could happen if that were to be a path that we end up on. Yeah. I wonder, I wonder what... And I think about this myself because I, I, someone asked this, and uh, it really did stick. Remember when? Remember when you said uh, it just goes black? Like you can, you can yeah. think all the way up to everything, and it just yep. goes black. Yep. I, I don't know. I made a video after the fact, just kind of because that really hit me hard, man. Like that really did hit me hard. I wonder if we will see it coming, like. In the week, couple of weeks leading up, couple of days, or if it'll just be like you wake up one day and it's just like shit hits the fan. I think that's I mean, the way it'll be. There'll be no yeah. time to prepare. The little by little by little by little by little that I talk about this logarithmic decay, it's all around us. And if you yeah. are not astute enough or aren't paying attention closely enough or or only watch the mainstream and get no no truth. Um, you you aren't noticing the little by little by little by little, but it's happening all around yeah. us. And so that all at once moment, it'll happen and catch everyone off guard. You cannot get out of the way of what you don't see coming. Yeah. And and most people don't see it coming. But if it happened tomorrow, you would look back and say, shit, I saw this coming a long yeah, time ago. There you go. You've That's... seen it. Now, I don't think yeah. it will give anyone time to prepare. It'll happen on a Monday morning. 
late at night Sunday, you know, when the world is as, when the Western world is asleep, these That's moves will point. be made. So, That's a good point. you know, if you haven't seen it now and are taking steps to prepare, what are you waiting for? And so I would argue that, yeah, it is happening all around us. It's just that there's not much in the way of awareness collectively. What do you think the best case scenario for us moving forwards is? Like, obviously not, not like what's most likely to happen, just like in a perfect situation, what would be the best landing or just... Even I think they revalue realistic. gold, which is held on the central bank's balance sheet in, a, in an account called the gold revaluation account. They revalue it to a level that most people would think be be ridiculous and impossible, ten or fifteen thousand dollars an ounce, and they peg a new a new dollar system to gold um, and use that as a form of immutability. It's a marriage between blockchain and gold. I really do believe that we will see something like that happen. You hear rumblings coming out of the IMF about this. You hear rumblings coming out of the BIS coming up about this. You hear the Russian finance minister Lavrov talking about this, that the BRICS currency will be pegged to a basket of commodities. What is gold but the only other tier one asset in the world? What have the central banks been doing? Buying more than at any time ever. And, and why would they do that? Why would they reclassify it tier one? I think the only way you have legitimacy in a system is to peg it to gold. Now, that doesn't do much for our debt. I look at that yeah. as being something that happens after a collapse where they come and issue a new system pegged to gold using blockchain technology, you know, but uh, I I think that any way we look at it, I think we have to go through a period of pain. You have to have that period of paying your tab and, you know, you, you, you own a bar and, and your buddy comes and sits at the end of the bar and drinks for free for 50 years. At some point, he's got to pay that tab. Well, it's going to hurt. When you finally pay that tab and i don't think there's any way around it but to rise from the ashes of a reset system it's going to have to be pegged to something with legitimacy and if you want to have any hope of retaining world reserve status or being looked at as a credible source um you have to have have it pegged and pull out of the politicians ability out of their hands the ability to destroy a currency the way they always have going back thousands of years all the politicians have always chosen inflation over the tough decisions even going back to roman times you know you look at these coins like this silver eagle here and if you look on the edges you can see the ridges right you see those ridges well they put ridges on coins because back in the roman days they would trim around the coins ever so slightly and do that to all the coins you end up with a whole basket full of extra shavings <laughs> that you can make more coins with that's why there are ridges on it you can't do that's that funny. now so that's that really <laughs> But that's true. And that's why, you know, politicians going all the way back to Roman times would choose that. So, yeah, I, I think that the only way that we get this credibility, pull ourselves out of this nosedive is to probably hit the ground and come back with something that would be legitimized moving forward. I don't see a way to pull out of this. I mean, certainly the, the first thing that would have to be done would be to stop spending. And if you look at, you know, we took in, I don't know, four plus trillion in tax revenues in last year, but we spent almost six trillion. Well, there's your two trillion deficit. If you go back to 2019, just the amount of spending we had, that four and a half trillion in tax revenues we took in somewhere in that neighborhood would have not only paid the, the deficit that year, but would have left 500 billion or so left over to work down the debt. But the problem is we are we are addicted to spending and a country that is addicted to spending, watching tax revenues get less and less and less in an economy that's getting tougher and tougher and tougher is not a good mix. So we're going to have to go through that pain would be my guess uh, in order to come out of this with a new system pegged to yeah. gold. Any way you look at it, I think there's going to be there's going to be some form of uh, of of comeuppance if you will we're going to have to make good on our on our balance sheet and if we don't then we default and the only way to get to a point of credibility would be to peg it with something legitimate and take it out of the politicians hands to just create money at will yeah i remember <clears throat> like two years ago i remember showing a clip on this other podcast i did with my friend he's a um uh c i think i think he's a CFA, but regardless, um, he showed this clip of federal chairman Jerome Powell talking about publicly saying like he could see a currency coexisting or even replacing the dollar someday. 
Yeah, I remember like, that was 2020, maybe. I remember yeah, that. Yeah. I mean, that's basically was acquiescing to the fact that that there will be a challenger, a, a currency that will rise to challenge the dollar for for dominance. Now, you know, the world reserve status, look, the reserve portion means our bond market. The settlement status, you're already beginning to see that. 20% of all oil sales last year were settled in other currencies. All of the BRICS nations are settling in their local currencies. And, you know, in terms of the reserve status, if you take a look at what gold has done since the beginning of the century, it's up 7.8% per year, whereas the S&P is up 7% per year, whereas the bond market is nowhere near that. So gold has outperformed the bond market and the stock market for the past 25 years, 24 years. And if you look at what it's done since 2020, in 2020, it was up like, uh, well, let me see if I have the numbers. I probably do here real quick. In 2020, if I can find it in 10 seconds, I'll read it to you and put my glasses on because I can't see squat without it. Uh, in 2020... Uh, and I don't know if I'm going to find it or not. I'll paraphrase it. If not, I'll be real close. In 2020 gold, the average price of gold was somewhere in the neighborhood of, of um, 1,780 bucks. 2021, it was just over 1,800 bucks. 2022 was like 1,850 and, and 2023, 1,950. So the price of gold keeps on ratcheting higher and higher and higher. It's the tortoise, not the hare. But if you're another country, well, shit, that not only does it outperform the bond market, it takes the counterparty liability out of the equation. So these countries are selling our treasuries and, and buying gold and using it as, as a bond market. In essence, they are replacing government debt with gold, which has a much longer history track record of being considered wealth or an asset rather than a government's debt being considered an asset. And so you're beginning to to see that, I think that when we talk about a new currency, it will be a settlement currency, first and foremost, that will settle all of the world's energy purchases in other currencies, not the dollar, which will drastically affect the reserve status of the dollar. And I think the way that the countries are looking at it in a bond market where last year, for the first time in 45 years, the 10-year treasury was had greater volatility than the price of gold, they're buying gold as their form of reserve instead of the U.S. Treasury, and they're settling in their local currencies. It will have dramatic effect on the value of the dollar. Here's where that hyperinflationary moment comes when, look, you guys sign an executive order to go green. We, you've weaponized the dollar. You're talking of confiscating that $300 billion in assets, not just weaponizing it or not just sanctioning Russia, but confiscating it, using it for the Ukrainian war. That's a whole different thing. No one will ever trust us ever, ever again. Right. So. I think we are rapidly approaching that moment where, you know, trust is is being uh, lost or already has, and gold is replacing what a bond market would be. So, yeah, I think you could see very, very likely with high probability a new settlement currency like Powell was worried about to challenge the dollar for global settlement in energy, mm. which has always been in dollars for 50 years. And the more of that that happens, remember, the petrodollar deal is you take our dollars for oil, and then you recycle your excess dollars in treasuries. Well, if there's no one using them to settle for oil, and instead of buying our treasuries, they're buying things like gold, which will have an inverse reaction to the to the value of the dollar, the whole thing, you don't need to issue a reserve currency with the bond market in the BRICS just yet in order to challenge the dollar. But it's interesting to note that they are just released like 28 billion in something called Maharaja bonds in the BRICS. They are releasing bonds in local currencies. You cannot buy them in dollars. They are only for countries to be purchased, the BRICS countries, in their BRICS currencies. The, the BRICS New Development Bank is issuing that. So yeah, it's happening. And I think it will happen and with greater severity and greater frequency. Going to silver, I sent you, I texted you an article about Mexico running out of silver in like two I've read that. 2026. Yeah. yeah, that was really interesting. But I want to share this. Now, this is this is the oh-so-controversial uh, article from John Forrest Little talking about U.S. silver stockpile rated by Defense Department and goes over some very interesting data because I got an email from someone yesterday, took some of this information, I reverted it to this because what he was saying is exactly this of why 
they are suppressing the price of silver and I most believe of it. it is used for military like um right here where, where is it at and ironically um, it's not counted in the silver institutes yeah uh silver supply demand yes. fundamentals so yeah the two i think biggest. i think the article that the pickaxe wrote is fantastic and yeah. while i can't validate it i think it's compelling as hell and, and it makes so much know, sense it does like silver is the most critical and strategic mineral silver yeah, it wins should be wars. considered a strategic metal yeah. not an industrial it is silver critical and strategic silver wins wars if you need silver for missiles and bombs and satellites and tanks and bullets then you best hope the military is taking our silver reserves instead of just using that silver for solar panels i i, I really hope that they have first dibs well, when you realize the military industrial complex has been in several hundred wars over the last, I don't know how many years, right. 50 years or whatever, it makes sense that they would want to suppress the price and the and the the um the the reasoning for owning it. I mean, if if that's really what they are doing, and and there's a lot to be said about the military industrial complex that isn't very flattering, but if that's if the whole business is of war, well, the main component here being silver in order to to have the tools of war well yeah you could see how this could be true and i think i know john and um i i think he's done a great job at bringing fact back yeah. it um but again i can't validate it other than to say i found it maybe one of the more compelling articles i've read yeah. in years on yeah that was um on on the silver supply side of things yeah then there's this one as well that was written um december yeah, and that's not just his work also i've read that yeah. elsewhere that I you know that they're they're running out of a below ground supply and yeah in i'm fact, actually gonna uh, find that one real quick in that fact was you got dave kranzler who wrote that you know that or it was vince vince lancy i believe who said that they're in the process of soft nationalizing the re remaining silver as well where they they realize that they've been the number one producer of silver but over the last um two years their production's down about 25 percent and falling and he's saying that the government is soft nationalizing meaning they're not going to be selling any or try to nationalize what little they have left so yeah it, when you realize the biggest silver uh supplier on the planet in terms of a uh, below ground or mining is is depleting at that rate to where you know you you can actually see that they would be out of uh, mineable silver deposits within a few years, at least those that yeah. haven't been explored. You know, there might be greater exploration to do out there, but with the cost being so low, the, it is a hindrance to exploration. So there hasn't been much. So what is known in terms of mineable supplies? Yeah, they say could be gone in just a few years. I've read that by uh, by several authors. Yeah, that was, um, yeah, here it is. Uh, this is by Richard Mills. Um, when you, when you realize that the Shanghai Gold Exchange on December 27th, the closing price of silver was 2650, but it was 2431 on the Chicago Board of Trade on the CME. You know, the world understands and, and the, the BRICs understand how important silver is. They're putting it two dollars and 20 cents, 10 percent higher than it is on, in London or on COMEX because it's, it's a strategic metal. India has imported almost 400 million ounces in the last two years which is more than yeah. is on COMEX. It is a strategic metal and parts of the world are realizing it's disappearing. And the scariest part is like Mexico is the, the largest producer. Like Mexico and Peru, I think, produce like more than half of the annual supply. And, you know, them pulling these numbers or decreasing is much different than another country that doesn't have the same poll. But th listen to this, Mexico regularly outputs 5,600 tons, and that's over the past 10 years, but has seen its reserves dwindle to just 37,000. If mining continues at this current pace, Mexico's silver reserves will be exhausted by the end of 2026. Yeah, I've that read that in several, in several articles. Yeah. That so is that's insane. the point. You have diminished supply, increased demand, uh, both militarily and industrially, along with monetary and demand and, and the green and digital applications, all of these things, it's a perfect storm. I don't know that I've ever seen an asset that offers more compelling um, supply demand fundamentals yeah. than, than you find in silver. And I, 
try to be objective in saying those things because it's easy to poke a hole in it if not. But I'm dead serious. I don't see anything yeah. as compelling as that. How could like yeah, not even close in my opinion. Like like there's so many different things. It is insane. Like it really is insane. Like the silver rabbit hole is, it's incredible. I mean, I've and seen you down that back, hole before. I've been down that hole. I see you walking by. Yeah, like like once silver explodes, I feel like everyone that hasn't bought will look back and be like, "What the? It was so obvious." You know, like it's crazy. It takes. It's a, it, it was it's obvious if you look, but the the counterintuitive nature of it. The counterintuitive rhetoric and price behavior of it is enough to drive people insane. Yeah, yeah. And in a country where instant gratification is not fast enough, well, that's to be expected. <laughs> but those yeah. people who see it clearly have strong fingertips and can hang on um, will be rewarded and, 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 and be careful what you wish for, because, you know, exploding yeah. silver could signal a lot of other things to yeah, the detriment that, of our well-being yeah. at the same time. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't do what you can to protect yourself and be able to survive and even thrive in, in what's coming. And, you know, I try and be objective. I don't see a, a reason to not look at silver as one of the most compelling trades of a generation for cert for certain of this decade. And I'm happy to go on record saying that. Yeah, that's a good point. It's like, be careful what you wish for. Cause if silver does hit triple digits, what does that mean? <laughs> well, you know, I, yeah, I like that. I need one of those. Uh, but yeah, I always I'll, say I'll like, send it to you. I'll send like you at one what of cost? Like we make a pretty penny, but at what cost? Right. Like, well, that's the point but, to everything. Yeah. At what yeah. cost? That could be the yeah. name of this of this interview. At what cost? Yeah. And everything <laughs> like, has a cost. Or, that's for sure. Or the the root of all evil. I always like that. I always wanted to. That was I was gonna name a second channel that and just talk more about like money stuff and not just silver i was thinking of naming giving my daughter that name the root of all evil but <laughs> ad teasing she just walked in over there so oh, give her funny. a hard time she's a sweetheart anyways yeah. brother i love yeah, our yeah, conversations we, but, and there's gonna yeah. be so much to talk about for yeah. the rest of the year and um we'll ride shotgun together and and watch it unfold and i think you know between the 200 meetings in russia leading up to the big one in October, the November elections, the issues here in this country with the border issue and 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 all of the things that are happening in hyperspeed, not to mention what's going on with the BRICS. And there's going to be so much happening. And, and, and true to the Chinese curse, may you live in interesting times. I swear to you, I think this will be the most interesting year in my life. And, and uh, I look forward to... Uh, you know, to t talking about it with you and everyone else out there in real time throughout the rest of this yeah. year, because uh, I think we ain't seen anything yet. Yeah, definitely. That's why you guys need to be subscribed and click the bell so you immediately get notified when I post. Uh, but yeah, anyways, um, thanks for your time, Andy. You I got hope it, you guys my man. And I'll look forward this. to seeing you yeah. next week, Thursday as well. Yeah, and, uh, every Thursday. Yep, yeah. I'm heading to Vancouver here very oh, really? shortly or the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference. So when oh, I wow. come back on Tuesday, just a short there and back, I'll have lots to talk about, I'm sure, from what happened there and uh, yeah. get you up to speed on what... what uh, I want what to start going to stuff like... Talking about. That'll be fun to like to travel and go to things like that. Well, you should. Like, you should. Yeah, like You're certainly someone even. who I think would add a lot of color to these types of shows. And yeah, well, I literally. can pull a couple <laughs> strings and get you invited to some of them moving forward if that's what you want to do there. It's a good yeah. way to get out there and talk to people in person. Yeah. You know, like yeah. like Jake, who's always commenting on, on the shows that I'm on. And you meet some wonderful people who will become your friends. And uh, certainly someone like yourself who has given so much information to the public, I think... Uh, you would enjoy it and I think they'd enjoy it. So yeah, we'll talk about that next time and I'll see if yeah. I can, uh, if you and I can make an appearance or two at some shows together yeah. or you never even know, maybe put together some of our friends and, and do our own show that would be down cool. here in Florida. I want to, uh, I want to get back on uh, Robert Kiyosaki's uh, podcast. Cause so much has happened since I was on over a year ago. Well, but, next time I talk to him, I'll tell him to reach out to you that you want to yeah. do that. Maybe I'll get I the still, two of us on together. Yeah, I still get emails from people like, hey, I just watched it, you know. But anyways, I'll let you go. Uh, anyways, yeah, thank you guys, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, I'll see you guys tomorrow. Peace.